everyone, welcome to Heat Check One on One. This is Ty Slater here with a very, very special guest, my man, Big Money Mike Damagala, the CEO, host of Inside Buzz, official NBA Buzz on Instagram. How you doing, Mike? What's up, Ty? I appreciate you having me on, brother. I appreciate you taking time out to come to GTA Heat Check. I appreciate it. For those of you that just joined us, make sure you follow GTA Heat Check, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as GTA Sports Network, gtasportsnet.com. It's an honor. First and foremost, let's get started. Let them know how you get started with Inside Buzz. Yeah, man. So, Inside Buzz came a little later, but it all started with NBA Buzz, which is uh, uh, started based on Facebook in January of 2012 when I was just 12 years old. So, I've grown that ever since on Facebook. That has 2.8 million followers. And, you know, I'm also pretty big on Instagram. You mentioned at official NBA Buzz. Find that on Instagram and Twitter on that ad. And yeah, I made the transition to YouTube as well behind the NBA Buzz brand, creating Inside Buzz, which is my interview-based show. Um, I started that about a year and a half ago. I've had 24 episodes. That's going well. All NBA players and you know uh, NBA-related people. Congratulations. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And most recently, uh, all my hard work through NBA Buzz, Inside Buzz, got me an ESPN podcast called The Truth, which is dropping on December 1st, and our first guest is Derek Anderson, NBA champion and NCAA champion in 1996. Wow. Can you let, because there's a lot of podcasters out there, a lot, a lot of people are getting into the podcast game. Yeah. Um, can you let them know that it's, it's not an easy road, and for one, can you kind of like break down how the start to now, like what was there any challenges, any problems you met along the way, uh, can you kind of break down the journey for them? Yes, sir. You know, to the first part of that, yeah, man, everybody has podcasts. It's crazy. Like, the field, every day, it's just more and more and more people coming, especially in sports. People love talking sports. But it's tough to really make your mark there. you got to be different. And that's for social media pages like an NBA Buzz or a podcast like Inside Buzz. Um, yeah, you got to be different. got to have all different guests. Make it look good. Um, problems that I've had? Uh, not... Not too much. Uh, Maybe just the look of the show from the beginning, you know, uh, finding my identity through the show. So exactly how I want the show to look. Like, I have an Inside Buzz banner behind this ESPN banner. Right. And I I only had that until probably episode 10. So the first, say, 10 episodes were just me in my backyard or me in my room with just a blank background or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then my editing skills got better and better. Um, I feel like my skills as a journalist got crisper. So I'm asking better questions, more engaging questions. So, not too many problems, but just improving over time and improving each episode, I would say. Okay. So with Inside Buzz on Instagram, uh, can you break down for the audience, when it comes to the reach and engagements, uh, what have you learned about the algorithms? Like, what, what, what's the... Not to, not to necessarily give away your secret sauce, but... Um, <laughs> Discreetly and kind of on the low, how how did you figure out how to master Instagram and then take that to YouTube? The transition. Yeah, yeah. Well, I first mentioned Facebook. So okay, Facebook was first. Okay. Facebook is like you can get away with posting a lot, but yeah. less is more. Right. But you still gotta post your content on Facebook. Like you can't just be posting one a day and expect to grow. Instagram, though, I see pages and it annoys me. You could post once or twice a day. And your post could get like 20,000 likes, because your average 10,000 likes. Yeah. Just because you post two times a day. Like me, I post generally probably like five to ten times a day, depending on what's going on. But my people engage. I like, I know what they want to see. But I'm not always showing the best numbers because I'm posting so much, but the algorithm on Facebook says otherwise, and I'm just going with the, blue, the blueprint I've been doing since the beginning, posting it up. What the people want to say. It does well, it'll do well. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So it just that's just how it is and I grow I grow nicely and uh, yeah, algorithms are tough, man. Facebook they're ever changing. Instagram, they change here and there, but less is more on Instagram. But you know, you don't always have to follow it. Your first your first episode. Can you like can you go back to that and, and explain the, 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 the feelings? Like was it butterflies? Were you nervous? Uh, can you kind of take take us back to that very first episode? And kind of give us the experience. My very first episode, um, this isn't exactly the best journalistic way to do it, but <laughs> I got Ryan Hollins through a connection of mine, and we couldn't lock down a time, so I took, I took like 
yourself your videos of me doing this for the questions. Like, hey Ryan, Mikey here, just want to ask you question one, blah, 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 blah. Then I would send question two and three and four and five, and then he would do the same thing to me back, and I would just, I just edited them together. It was just episode one, it, it looked a little cheap, but I was just starting out, and I didn't have any experience. You know, um, I, I heard Ryan Hollins could come on the show. So I had to had to make it look good somehow. And this was pre, I mean, Zoom was a thing, but Zoom wasn't as hot as it was now, so I didn't know what to use yet. So that's how I did the first one. And from that one experience, even though it may have been a little embarrassing or a little awkward, you know, having to hold, I mean, I'm sure your arm was flexing after the episode was done, I'm sure, after holding your phone up that long. Um, did you know exactly the next steps, like what you needed? Like, and, and if so, like, did you have anybody help you out along the way? Did you have a team behind you? Uh, you know, can you break that down for us? Uh, yeah, it's, it's just all me, all me and everything inside Buzz and official NBA Buzz. I do the editing, I do the posting, everything. Wow, but, uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, all me. But uh, what was I for inside Buzz? Yeah, I, I had the vision definitely. Like, I knew I wanted to you know, get a better front camera, which you can see me clear now. I knew I wanted to get a background. I would just have to pin down somebody who does backgrounds. Um, if you don't mind me asking, did somebody you know did that one for you? Or did you already have that one? Yeah, the, yeah. No, this is a local shop. Uh, so I'm in Plainview, New York. Okay. And a guy, I mean, you could go to any banner guy. I'm sure there's banner people around you, like printing people. So this is a step and repeat banner made by Merrick Printing. In Plainview, New York, just you know, a couple miles away from it. Nice little plug, okay. Yep, yeah, of course, man. Awesome, awesome. Tell us, uh, when it comes to interviewing NBA players, uh, everybody's experience is different. Uh, every player is different. Uh, can you can you give us like maybe your your if you have a top three or your or your ultimate favorite, if you can pinpoint one that's your favorite interview, which one would that be and why? I'll go with my Nancy Lieberman interview. Um, you know, I love all my interviews. I've never had a problem with any NBA player, any questions I've asked, him, nothing like that. But Nancy Lieberman was so nice. You know, she's a Hall of Fame woman's player, and she's like, every NBA player knows her. She's in, the, she's in the Hall of Fame, man. So, you know, that was awesome. That actually came about two weeks after Kobe's death in, in wow. January. This was February. Okay. And it was the day of when they, uh, you know, they recognized him, everybody met at the Staples Center to give their condolences to Kobe and, you know, the, his memorial. Right. So that was that day. So she she did, wasn't there, but she told me a crazy story about how she was almost on the helicopter because she was going to train Gianna Bryant. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. Wow. Wow. And when her son heard the news, her son's a professional player overseas, I think, in Israel. Mm-hmm. And her, her somewhere like that. She was calling him, and he was, like, frantic and, like, felt like he was going to pass out because she was supposed to be on the helicopter. But wow. she wound up not going on for scheduling, you know, problems and stuff like that. She was going to go to the Mamba Academy and train uh, with Kobe and Gianna, yeah. Wow. You know, prominent, prominent woman's basketball figure. So she was telling me about that, giving me all behind-the-scenes stories of, you know, meeting Kobe, uh, playing, you know, playing with Kobe, being around him. And just other stories from her career and other NBA guys and just being a Hall of Famer. So she was very cool. Um, she she grew up in Queens. You know, I'm, I'm out here in Long Island. So we grew up not too far apart. Maybe she's about 20-ish miles from me. Okay. Uh, she was in the Rockaways, you know, maybe 25 miles. And, uh, yeah, we were just talking about that, too. And just after the interview, kind of like how every interview goes, you know, once the camera closes and everything's done recording, you thank them and stuff. And she gave me great advice and asked me where I'm going to school. And she used to play basketball, like pick up basketball at my school and allow you post on the island. So she was, we were just talking some local Long Island stuff. So it, it was all cool. That's great. It's always great to have uh, what you could argue is a hometown hero, somebody close by that kind of can relate to your area where you're you know, familiar yeah. with and, and make that connection. Do you have a sports background? Did you play sports as well? Like, were you into basketball or... Yeah, yeah, I played baseball until I was, until like 11th grade. No, I was starting NBA Buzz at the time, and well, NBA Buzz was already made for a couple of years, but it was in the developing process, and I'm not going to lie, like, I put everything into NBA Buzz then and even now, so 
you know, uh, practice and games would take away from stuff. Yeah. I remember, remember I had a game with like Rondo was traded to the Mavericks, and I was pissed that I missed it. <laughs> so yeah, I'm glad you brought up Rondo. It's funny. Um, I hear Rondo's got a few teams that's trying to get him this season. Yeah, man, he's a hot commodity after that uh, postseason and finals run. I don't. I mean, me personally, I would rather him become a player coach for the Lakers. I really don't want him to leave. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't think he should be. To be honest, I don't think he needs to change his scenery. He's got it all made in L.A. Stay, you yeah. Know? Stay, stay where you at. Bob's and LeBron and AD, and he's good. I'm hearing reports about Lonzo possibly going back to the Lakers. Is there any any rumblings you're hearing over there about that? No, I didn't hear anything. I think Lonzo's going to stay put in Nola. Yeah, the, the reason why I think that's a rumbling, it started when he signed with Clutch. Cause he signed with Clutch. Okay. So there's that connection. Then they know Rondo's kind of getting up there in age, so we don't know how many games he got left before his, his father Tom's tapping him on the shoulder. So, of course, there's these rumblings that they could find a way to get Lonzo back now that they got AD. Lonzo didn't have a great year, so he, had, he could take a pay cut. Kuzma's all, is on the trade block to go to the Spurs for um, DeRozan. I know you heard about that. That's a big hot button topic. Um, Danny Green might end up back in San Antonio to finish his career. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of movement. Um, so I gotta ask you because I know I know this has been probably sizzling on your mind. This particular off season with the bubble, the CBA, uh, the 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 salary cap being what it's being is kind of you know on the line based on them losing a lot of money with the shutdown uh, with COVID. Is it one of those things where this off season might be one of the biggest off seasons in NBA history? Because of all the player movement, nobody's really staying put. Everybody might be shuffling around, playing musical chairs with teams. The craziest in NBA history, no. Uh, if you're asking me which one would be the craziest off the top of my head, I can't tell you. But I would say no, just because, yeah, there's going to be a lot of movement, but it's not like huge top, top notch players are going to be moving. Like, I think last season was pretty crazy with KD on the move, Kyrie on the move, and everything like that. I agree. But, you know, AD's locked down pretty much. You know, he's not going anywhere. He already kind of verbally agreed with the Lakers. And after him, who's the top dog? Like a Van Fleet, Brandon Ingram. So, you know, there's there's good guys out there. You yeah. Know, there's, there's great players on the market. But, you know, I don't think so. I, but, free agency, no. What I think will be the craziest part of the, the offseason will be the draft coming, uh, you know, next Wednesday. I think there's going to be a lot of trade movements, people moving around, trading these players to get a better pick, uh, trading a pick to get players and whatnot. I could see Drew Holiday being on the move from the Pelicans, you know, in a trade, because uh, he's on the block. Um, the Celtics have, like, the 14th, like, the 21st, and, the, like, the 30th pick. So they're they're going to make moves. So who are they going to bring in? They, they kind of need a center, if you ask me. Uh, you brought up a, a, a great point, um, the draft, and I like how you segue into that because I definitely want to get your take on that and definitely pick your brain on this. When it comes to the draft, everybody's looking at Lamelo Ball. It's no secret he's the you know the hype is is real. Uh, if it ain't on Zion's level, it's right there neck and neck with Zion's level when it comes to the hype. Um, he's been in the media since he was what you know fifteen, if not younger. Um, so he's been in the media for a while. Kind of went away for a second, went overseas, come back, got off the draft boards, back on the draft boards. Um, I got to ask Mikey, where do you see LaMelo Ball landing and why? Oh, man, I, uh, that's tough. That's tough because you look at his play style and you look at the teams who are in the top three to five. They don't need him. Like, exactly. You took the words out of my mouth. Like, Minnesota has d lower already, right? He's nice and young. He's still finding his group. The Warriors have Steph and Clay at the one and the two. Three, the Hornets. Right. They need him. They need him. They need him. And I have an argument for that. I have an argument for that. I agree, I agree that they need him. But they also have Terry Rozier at the one. See, so that, mmm. Ah. Ah, ah. Terry Rozier. I have a, I have a gripe with him. My, my gripe with him is I feel like he got the big money. But he, he didn't finish working on his, his shot. And I feel like the reason why Boston kind of gave up on him is not just because he wanted the big money. I mean, that was definitely the icing on the cake. 
the real underlying issue that Boston didn't want to say because they didn't want to like have teams turn away from him was he don't have a jump shot. So you have a point guard who doesn't want to pass the ball first. He wants to be the guy. And he's on Team Jordan, so he wants to be the guy, but he doesn't have the jump shot to be the guy. So in my mind, the only, the only reason I would make a case for Charlotte to go ahead and make a move for LaMelo Ball is you're getting a pass first that can shoot. Because he can't, but he can but he can pass as well. You got a dual threat. Somebody who's young, you can build around him. You got the PJ Washington still, you still got the bridges, you still got you know, you still got young pieces to build with. Um, it's a young team. They're not there's no expectations. The expectations are really low. The other underlying conflict that might be there is you're dealing with Jordan and Lamelo's with Puma. So I don't know how that would work out. I don't know how that would work out. If I, I don't know how that would work out. So that might be the deal breaker. I mean, you sign a deal with Puma. I'm Jordan. I can't rock with that. My team wears Jordans. You wearing Puma. And then uh, MJ and Lavar. MJ Lavar. Ah. Lavar gonna say about MJ. I guess. But in all honesty, you got Lamelo Ball, who's been a pro for a couple years now. Like, True. That's pretty crazy to think about. True. I I don't see I don't see Minnesota passing up on him. Oh no! Don't send on the oh no! I, oh no! Don't do that. I, I think Anthony Edwards is a great player, and that kid's gonna be a savage too. He's, he's a strong, big guard. But how do you pass up on the mellow? Yeah. You know? No. Just think, just think, Ty. The Timberwolves got a great pick in Carl Anthony Towns, but he hasn't brought in the main thing. You're right. He really hasn't. You're right. You know? So they're gonna. They gotta take a gamble on Lamelo. I mean, the dude is like six eight, six eight point guard. He improves as a shooter. Yeah, he's inconsistent. They just need something, man. They need a little bit of Hollywood in there. The Minnesota Timberwolves. So, in the words of in the words of Deion Sanders, ain't nobody care about that. Don't nobody care about Minnesota. I don't want to see Lamelo. I don't want to see triple Bs in Minnesota. That that just don't you. You're taking a. a ca- you're taking a Cali kid who's seen the world, has been around the world, and you're landing him in Minnesota? I feel that because, listen, everybody in New York wanted him badly. We finished at the, the bottom of the barrel. We thought we were getting the top three pick this year. Ugh. But everybody wanted LaMelo in New York. It would have fit perfectly. He would have brought that Hollywood. Take him. Knicks, take him. Get five. Fi- Call. I, I, I said it on the podcast with my man Tom. I said, "Yo, if I'm if I'm uh, the Knicks, I'm on the phone with Minnesota immediately. Look, y'all trying to sell y'all pick. We want it. We'll give y'all whatever y'all want. We'll give you picks for the next two years. Like, just I, we need Lamelo Ball in New York. I need Lavar. I need Jello. I need them in New York. That would be something. Talk about headlines." Talk about headlines. We're talking about we're talking hype as big as Patrick Ewing. We have y'all haven't had a hype like that since '85. You know, not no not knocking those mellow years because Mello, you know, did his thing. Uh, Tyson Chandler did his thing, but you know, Jeremy Lin had his couple weeks, about a month. You know what I'm saying? But y'all haven't had a hype like that since the '90s. Yeah, a, a great rookie to come in who really hasn't been. Just RJ off the top of my head. Off the top of your head, yeah. I mean, and RJ's nice. RJ's nice, but RJ needs a LaMelo ball to facilitate to him. He can't create his own shot. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, yeah, and you got to give RJ some time. I think people are, are not remembering that that kid is, I think, just turned 20 years old. Like, you know, um, yeah. people see Ja and Zion with the immediate impact. RJ's going to be there. He averaged about 15 last year. That's good for a rook. I agree. I agree. Um, and then you have, um, you got Mitch Robinson. Um, great player. Great player. Great player. He to be unleashed. That kid needs to be unleashed. He only plays about 28 minutes a game. Y'all need to let him shoot. He's a shooter. A big man that can shoot. Let him shoot. Let him Let him get confident with the jump shot. That's something this offseason, some offseason videos. He's got, he's got to prove it. He's got to prove he's got a shot. He does, he does. Like most players, um, and you can look at Ben Simmons in Philly, most players you have to give them that push, that confidence. If they don't come out, if they don't come off with it like a D'Lo or a, uh, uh, you know, you got other players like Trey Young that come in, the, come in the league with a jump shot, 
or at least the confidence of a jump shot, like a John Morant, um, some players need that push. The team needs to be like, look, we're going to get you a couple plays, a couple opportunities. You, if you don't make the shot, don't worry about it. We'll work on it. Um, don't be afraid to pull that trigger because then you get a Ben Simmons who's been in the league three, four, five years and he only shoots in off-season videos. I mean, he only shoots for Instagram and that's terrible. It's terrible. He doesn't even, he doesn't, he doesn't even shoot mid-range jumpers. As a, as a matter of fact, nobody does anymore, you know? I miss that part of the game. I do. Uh, the Kobe Bryant, Carmelo Anthony type of game. I miss. Yep. T Mac, MJ, all T- those guys. Yeah, you know? yeah, definitely. The, the mid range you know, game is missing. I was watching videos recently of a young James Harden. Harden, when he first got to Houston, he had a mid range game, but then he just fell in love with his setbacks. You know? Well, I, I think it's. Um, you can blame Daryl Morey for that. Give him some credit on yeah. that because when you're dealing with a guy that's all about the analytics, They'll look at the percentage of the shot and say, "Well, that's a low percentage shot to them." I hate that. I hate. I hate it too. I hate it too. I do. I think. I think it should be the. I think it should be the opposite. Honestly, I think it should be the opposite. Yeah, I mean, dude, uh, mid range jumpers. Those are easy pickings in the NBA right now. Like, it's wide open. Wide open. So, so why are you gonna force a three if you can just you know bank in a little mid range like Timmy Duncan? It's, it's, it, exactly. I, I agree. I, I feel like the mid range. It's just like good defense. It's underappreciated, underrated, and the the game, the overall game is missing that. I, there are I know that there's casual. We're not now now our people in our profession. We're not casual fans. Hopefully, I mean there might be some podcasts out there. They might have a couple casuals, but casual fans like the scores being 130 to 145 and. I can't stand it. I, I can't stand it. All offense, no defense. The game was not built like that. That's not the game that I remember. I grew up on a game where you played defense, you locked them down. Yep. Now they're just running up and down, popping threes with 20 seconds in the shot clock left. And it's just, you know, and they, they brick, then a fast break. If the fast break misses, boom, push up four for a three. You know, so it's like somebody, MJ, needs to resurrect in this era. And just destroy from the mid range, and just plant the seed in people's minds that a, a potent mid range scorer can really just get buckets for you. You know. I agree. I mean, that's why players like Giannis Antetokounmpo can shoot eighty percent from where he shoots from because he understands the mid range. And for him, even though analytics say low percentage, his mid range is a high percentage. His best shots come in between twenty feet, ten feet. Yeah, and it's funny. You know what I think it is. I mean, you've probably heard the term Cooper. Like, I feel like late 90s, especially the 2000s, had Hoopers who will just, like AI, T-Mac, Kobe, who will just go out there, throw the moves on you, cross you back, boom, hit a mid-range. They want a three, boom, they'll go nail a three. They could do everything. Now I feel like there's not as many guys who could just do everything. You know, like like those players I mentioned. I mean, of course there are, but... Coopers, I mean, just getting any kind of bucket you need. I feel like, like Harden, he was a hooper. Now he's just trying to get to the free throw line and maybe just take step back three. So how can you call call that a hooper? You know, it's just a different league we're in, man. Now, Kobe said it best in his inter- one of his last interviews he did a few years back, where they they asked him, and it was on the jump with Rachel Nichols. Um, she asked T Mac and Kobe. Can James Harden win a championship playing the way he plays? And he made it, I know you remember it, he made it very clear that that is not championship basketball. Because Kobe knows firsthand, I can drop 80 points in a game if I want to. But those were the worst years of the Lakers. They were they were getting bounced out in the first round and missing the playoffs altogether, right? So, yes, Kobe can be a killer on the court. Mama mentality is a real thing. But if you don't know how to dial it back, and, and as you said earlier, sometimes less is more, and get the team involved, you get what you get in Houston right now. And while we're on the Houston topic, because, I mean, that's the hot-button topic right now, my whole take on the Houston situation is this. You have a player in James Harden who got to Houston, and they literally spoiled him rotten, like to the point where you can't tell him anything because not only did y'all give him an MVP playing that way 
every player he's played with, Dwight Howard, he's had great co-stars. Trevor Reza, Eric Gordon, even Austin Rivers. I mean, you've you had players that can do things for you and get things done. Now you get down to the CP3, Russell Westbrook situation. At some point, because nobody's saying this, we're going to address the elephant in the room. It's hard. It's him. It is. It's him. And until they address it and come to the grips with that, Houston's never going to get back to the Western Conference Finals again. Listen, in my opinion, with I, I've been saying it for probably the last two or three years. Two years, yeah. Mm-hmm. Continues this play. Like Kobe said, they're just not going to win a championship. They get you MVPs, but you're never going to get a chip. He might, like you said, he might get his MVPs. He might get eight, you know, seven to ten assists per game. But those seven to ten assists per game don't show the full. You know, like it's, it's a misconception. Stats don't tell. Stats don't tell the whole game. If you're not, if you're not actually watching the games and you're just reading the stats, because there there are podcasts that do that. They read the stats, and it looks like he's getting everybody involved because Eric Garrett Gordon has twenty points one night. Daniel House will go off for fifteen here and there. Austin Rivers might go off one night and hit four threes in the game off of the assist, but it's forced. It's stat padding. It's that bad. See, I like Harden. I say this all the time. But he would lead a championship team if he gets himself a solid big man. Like, I don't know why they got rid of Capel. I like Jimmy Capel. They, they, for some strange reason, they went. They thought small ball was going to win because nobody was doing it. I'm like, okay, here's the problem with that. It works for a few games. Mm-hmm. People watch, Teams watch film. Any athlete will tell you, when it comes to an opponent, you watch footage. You watch film. And they're like, okay, if you have PJ Tucker, who's in his thirties, he's six foot five, six four, six five, playing the five every night, you're gonna body him. Like you can shoot over him. Most centers in the league can shoot over him. Mm-hmm. So why are you know that that Houston Rockets team, they live and die by the three when they're playing that small. And they they die by it all the time. Every time, every That's single right. time. I just think Harden needs to take some more mid range, attack the basket, looking for a buck God, like his old you. self. Um, you know, cut down on the step back long threes that brick here and there. Like yeah, they go in and just get get a great center around him to just play some defense. And you be fine. you had one. You had Clint Capella. Yeah, exactly. You remember you remember how many lobs he used to throw to him. Capella used to put up like 20 and 15 here and there. That's why he got paid. That's why he got paid. He, he had the numbers to get paid. But my thing is, if when you have a, um, a general manager of basketball operations like Daryl Morey who is strictly about the numbers and not looking at the team chemistry, you make moves that look good on paper. Okay, we're going to be this, we're going to, we're going to show the league that we can play elite small ball and make a deep playoff run. Well, what he failed to realize is the Boston Celtics play small ball. Yeah. And they do it way better. Why? Because they have shooters that are not selfish. They're not stat padding. They know how to get ball movement because Brad Stevens is all ball movement. You can play small ball when you have good ball movement and you're not forcing the assist or adding stats and trying to fill your stats in the fourth quarter. And you got to give credit to Daniel Tice on that team because he fills his role nicely. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. He's not the typical center. You know, he's like 6'10", strong, strong dude down there. He can rebound. He defends nice. And he knows his role. He knows he's his not role. trying to go out there and score the ball. The ball. I he agree. He a little drop off to a dunk inside and scores six points a game. He's happy yeah. because he knows his role. It, it, for him, he can have, a like you said, a six-point game, but he'll get the game-winning block to keep them – in the win in the last minutes of the game. So I agree with that. I agree with that. Um that 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 Houston situation though, I, I, I wish that, you know, Chris Paul's hamstring didn't go out on them the year that they got there because I feel like they would have won that year. That that was their year. After that it, it, it it's like they, they regressed every year after that. Now Ty, I gotta ask you, I'll take a little interview role here. Go ahead. Now I'm undecided about Westbrook. Westbrook wants out. Now where's Who's going to suit him, and where's he going to go? He loves to be more ball-dominant like his OKC years. You're going to love my answer. Yeah. 